may I invite my colleague, uh, Dr. Rahul Dige, to take you through um, to take you through the rules of the game, um, and then I will uh, then introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Raj Hambadi from the United States. Uh, maybe we have to hold on for a minute till he joins us back. Um, so Rahul, as soon as he's back, can you sort of spell out the rules of the game? Yes, yes. Thank you, Rahul, and uh, welcome to Dr. Raj Echambadi. Uh, good evening. In times of great uncertainty, employees look to their organization for strength and survival. Today, we have Dr. Raj Echambadi joining us from the United States to take us through building and sustaining innovative organizations. He's a distinguished professor and has an impressive, um, and has impressive credentials. Dr. Raj Echimbadi is the Dunton Family Dean of the DMR Mekim School of Business at Northeastern University. Prior to joining DMR Mekim, Echimbadi served as the Alan J. and Joyce D. Bals Professor and the Senior Associate Dean of Strategic Innovation in the College of Business at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, an extremely prestigious university. With over 25,000 faculty members serving more than 5,000 undergrad and graduate students, DMR Mechem School of Business is known for its thought leadership across all business domains, as well as its teaching ex excellence. The essence of Northeastern and DMR Mechem is experiential learning, rigorous academic classroom content, which is blended with meaningful business experience through their signature global cooperative, uh, cooperative programs. It's a unique model of business education, one that inspires students and molds them into impactful business leaders. Echambari's charge is to collaborate with the talented DMR Mekim faculty and staff to execute this vision. Echambari's major research interest in strategic, in, is strategic innovation and focus on how firms balance the importance of exploring opportunities found in nascent markets with exploiting opportunities in current markets. His research articles have been published in some of the top business and statistics journals. In 2004, his paper on employee entrepreneurship, describing how senior employees from incumbent companies founded new ventures that then directly competed with those incumbent themselves, won the Academy of Management Journal Best Paper Award. Utilizing principles from his work on innovation, he helped launch the online MBA program at Illinois. This program known as the IMBA and launched in partnership with Coursera has been hailed by the media as a breakthrough innovation in graduate education. He has also obtained several research grants, including one from the Kaufman Foundation to study technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation issues. Echambadi is also an accomplished teacher. He's taught a wide range of subjects, courses at the undergraduate, MBA, and executive MBA and PhD levels, and has received numerous accolades at the University of Illinois for his teaching achievements, including the Campus Excellence Award in Professional and Graduate Teaching and the College of Business Alumni Award for Teaching Excellence. Echambari received his undergrad degree in Mechanical Engineering from Anna University in India and his PhD in Marketing from the University of Houston, Texas. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Raj Echambari to this webinar, brought to you under the AGs of the Distinguished Speaker Series Executive Education, Dhanan Sagar University, Bengaluru. Good morning, Dr. Echambadi, and over to you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Subarov. Thank you for that kind introduction. I am actually trying to start the video. For some reason, it says uh, failing to start. So let's not, uh, uh, you know, obviously there is some technical difficulty, but uh, let's not uh, worry about the technicalities. Uh, 
I'm the uh, this topic is timely, and I want to thank you for this uh, opportunity uh, for me to speak about uh, 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 innovation, which is a very timely topic at this point in time. And are you able to see my video? Not the video. We can see your screen. Can you see me actually? Um, it's blank, right? Yeah, we can't see you too. Okay, for some reason, it's not allowing me to share. Let me stop sharing. Let but me we go can backwards. see. Us, but I could see your PPT. Okay, uh, you know, are these uh, slides actually with the uh, 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 with the people right now, the participants? No, no, no. Okay, so uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Can you see it now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Apologize. Uh, my talk over the next 40 minutes or so is going to be fundamentally on uh, building and sustaining innovative organizations. And uh, as I said before, thank you to uh, uh, Professor Subara for this invitation. And it's always fantastic to talk to Indian audiences. As you can see, I'm of Indian origin, left uh, for the US about 25 years back, and I've been working on uh, innovation related topics. So if you can see my slide, this is actually from 1894. Uh, this was called the Great Manor Crisis of 1894. At that point in time, London had about 50,000 uh, uh, horses, and the horses were the predominant mode of transportation. And horses dropped about 15 to 35 pounds of manure every day. So. Uh, Times of London in 1894 actually had a headline saying that London is going to uh, get buried in nine feet of manure by 1950. This was basically what happened. Uh, uh, this was a real uh, headline uh, from the Times of London. Of course, we know that did not happen. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, cars came to the rescue and uh, you know, we uh, did not have that crisis in 1950. Uh, at the bottom right of your screen, you are actually, this is uh, small, so don't worry about reading it, but I wanted to make a point here. Uh, this is about the life expectancy of the world population from 1800 to uh, today. And when you think about the life expectancy of the United States in the mid 1850s, it was about 40. And today it's about uh, close to 80. Uh, when you think about Korea, Korea's, uh, uh, South Korea's uh, uh, life expectancy in the early 1900, it has actually quadrupled literally uh, in the last 100 years. Uh, similarly, India has gone from early 20s to about 66 or so right now. Uh, and, and, and the point you know, I, I'm going to make is, this is all possible because of innovation. I was actually reading something the other day that uh, from Greg Estherbrook's uh, uh, paradox uh, uh, book that the wines that we drink, uh, that we get from a local convenience store is actually far better than the wines that were actually drunk by the kings of uh, uh, France, if you will, in the 17th and 18th century. And, and to me, fundamentally, it's because of innovation. And, and so one of the things that I wanted to highlight is the fact that innovation is a message of hope. Uh, innovation is a risk management tool. And therefore, fundamentally, innovation is actually the way for us to move forward into the future. Uh, there is a very famous quotation in Clayton Christensen's book. Uh, of, uh, you know, uh, it was his... Uh, uh, innovators prescription book where he talks about how 30% uh, of the population today that is in ICU would have actually been dead 30 years ago. 
And 30% of the people uh, who are treated as outpatients today would have been in, uh, in uh, uh, ICUs about 30 years ago. That tells you the, uh, how our quality of life keeps on improving fundamentally because of innovation. Again, uh, to me, when I talk about innovation, it's uh, uh, much more broad based and I'll get to the definition in a moment. And uh, given the uh, students, uh, one of the things that they will ask is what does, what does innovation mean? And to me, innovation is a continuum. Innovation can be a process innovation to improve processes, to cut costs. It could be a radical innovation moving from a VCR to a DVD player. Uh, it could be a, a transformative uh, a, a business model innovation. Uh, when Amazon.com comes in and upends traditional brick and mortar retailers, et cetera. So it spans a continuum, if you will. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the technicalities at this point in time uh, about what these various innovations are and the underlying mechanics are different. But, but what is common across this continuum is this definition that innovation to me is about executing ideas. Innovation is not about ideas alone. One of the fundamental myths that I've seen in the last 20 years of my, of my academic and consulting career is innovation is somehow seen as creativity alone. Well, creativity is about ideas, but innovation is about execution. When you don't have execution and you have only creativity, you know, that is, you know, as, uh, as uh, uh, Thomas Alva Edison once said, uh, it's mere hallucination. And, and so uh, fundamentally it has got to be about execution. And, and that is, that is a, a very important part of definition for me. And the second aspect of innovation for me is that it is not only about generating new ideas, but it's also about reconfiguring existing ideas in novel ways. You, it, it, it is just putting together uh, interesting ideas. And I'm going to give you an example. Think about Netflix. When Netflix came in, um, uh, they came in as a mail order DVD uh, company. And uh, it was around, mail order in the United States had, had been around since the 1870s. You know, Sears was the first major retailer to use mail order and so on. So it was there. Uh, the DVD technology was not uh, Netflix's. Actually, uh, that was the time, if you see in the late 1990s, was the slight inflection that DVDs were getting uh, you know, uh, started, if you will, were getting commercialized and getting accepted and so on. And, and what Netflix did was it took these two different disparate ideas of mail order and, and, and uh, DVDs put it together in a phenomenal business model that that turned out to be extraordinarily successful. The one thing that I want to uh, uh, mention here, as I'm talking about reconfiguring existing ideas in novel ways, is uh, at a at a very fundamental level, uh, this is the thing that you need to understand about innovation. It is not just product. It is not just product process. It is not just business model. Sometimes it can be disparate, but it's all, you know, the, the comprehensive way you think about innovation, about reconfiguring existing ideas in novel ways is actually critical, you know, and I'm, I'm going to expand on this over the next 20 minutes or so, but for level setting, this is my idea of innovation, reconfiguring existing ideas in novel ways as well. Uh, is to me uh, innovation, which leads me to the point. Some of you might say, wait a minute. Uh, innovation is fundamentally sounding and looking like value creation. And that is absolutely true. To me, when I think about innovation, I think about three different strategies, uh, three different foundations, if you will. Uh, it is about creation of value. It is about capture of that value through appropriate pricing mechanisms, appropriate, uh, you know, uh, uh, facets in your business model. And last but not the least, it's about execution or sustenance of that business model in the long run through loyalty programs and, and, and customer relationship management and so on. In this talk, over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to focus more on value creation uh, because to me, that is, that is essentially the most uh, uh, critical part. 
uh, you know, as far as uh, the future is concerned. Uh, and, and when we talk about value, uh, typically people think about technologies alone. And I want to emphasize uh, to the audience there, technology is one part of the equation, but markets are critical as well. So the one thing that I always tell people, and I want you to remember this, it is not the best product that wins out in the marketplace. It is actually the best fitting product, the product that best, best fits the customers that actually wins out in the marketplace. And I'm gonna give you a, a few examples to kind of uh, go over uh, uh, what, what I really mean by this. You know? So uh, again, I talked about Netflix. It's a combination of both. Uh, it's a combination of, uh, of technologies. It's a combination of, uh, of uh, uh, markets. So they had the DVD technology. Again, I, you have to understand in 90, the late 1990s, 1999, when Netflix came in, less than two and a half percent of the American population had access to a DVD player. Netflix made a bet on that and said, this is the market that we are going to go after, right? So that is an important thing. Uh, you know, uh, if you when you think about an example like Yellowtail Wines, uh, which is uh, in the last 15 or 20 years has been the fastest growing uh, uh, a wine, if you will, in the Western uh, world. Uh, and when you think about how they started, uh, if you had asked me in the late 1990s, is there an opportunity for a wine company uh, in the United States? I would have said probably not with the current strategy. And what Yellowtail did was they studied the market and they found that, that wine is a very complicated category. Wine intimidates people. And, and therefore, uh, 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 they needed to simplify it. Uh, when you have, uh, if you have bought wine, you know that there are, e for each thing, there are 20 or 30 different attributes, the vintage and the, and the uh, type of wine and where it was grown and, 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 and stuff like that. And what Yellowtail did uh, was Yellowtail simplified the category. Yellowtail basically said, there is only one Merlot, there is only one Chardonnay. And, and so don't worry about it, come in. It is gonna be in the budget wine category. At that point in time, when they launched it, it was 599 to 799 in the US, et cetera. And the rest is history. And, and the reason I say this is sometimes, uh, one of the advice I'll give you from a value creation perspective is, uh, use a combination of technology and markets and try to figure out how you can actually differentiate yourself. When Starbucks came in, coffee uh, was sold. Uh, coffee was a commodity. Starbucks made it an emotional experience. Uh, when you think about, uh, 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 you know, uh, an example uh, like insulin, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the insulin uh, product. Uh, the growth of insulin over the last uh, 105 years or so. Insulin was discovered in 1921. Uh, before insulin came in, uh, it was it was near death for uh, patients with uh, 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 who who were diagnosed with type two diabetes. You know, I mean, of course, we didn't uh, have the science back there, but but it was it was people were hung, people became famished, and 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 it was it was near fatal. So in 1924, uh, Eli Lilly uh, takes. Uh, insulin that was discovered in the University of Toronto labs and then launches it into the marketplace. Uh, when insulin uh, came out in 1924, insulin's uh, uh, impurity levels were 50,000 parts per million. Uh, and, and today it is zero parts per million. So that tells you exactly uh, how uh, insulin has evolved. It went from 50,000 parts per million to 10,000 parts per million to about 10 parts per million in the 1980s. And when Eli Lilly, the dominant player in the marketplace, decides to create a new synthetic insulin called Humulin, uh, it was zero parts per million. And uh, they create a Humulin. It was a $700 million investment, et cetera. They go to the marketplace and the market doesn't adapt, adopt uh, the product. 
And the market didn't adapt the product in the mid 1980s was, and this is fundamentally what I want to tell you, uh, is the, that, that the consumers at that point in time felt that the 10 parts per million insulin did fit their needs as well. It was not a problem for 99.9% .9 of the population at that point in time. Uh, and 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 99 percent, I would say, I wouldn't go 99.9 percent. 99 percent of the population, for one percent of the population, people had did have problems with this slight amount of impurity, etc. When insulin went from 10 parts per million to zero parts per million, Eli Lady thought they could get price premiums. They didn't because consumers felt that the 25 percent price premium was not worth it. Doctors didn't feel that the new uh, humulin was not worth it, etc. And this is fundamentally what I wanted to explain here. When you think about innovation, do not think of innovation in the absence of the market, in the absence of the segment that, that you are going to go after. It is the combination of technology and market that actually enables you to create a best fitting product uh, for the marketplace. And, and that to me, is fundamentally uh, uh, how you need to think about innovation. Obviously, uh, this is uh, something that I do over a two or three week uh, period. And so what I thought I'll do is, uh, again, I'm not gonna go over this. On, on your slide, you will see something called need, approach, benefits, and competition. Uh, this is a framework that was provided by Curtis Carlson, uh, Kurt Carlson. And uh, you can actually type NABC, Kurt Carlson. You will get a lot of articles. He's actually a professor of practice at Damore McKim. He's actually the guy who was the president of Stanford Research Institute. And this is a useful way to think about the very specific steps as you think about value creation. And I thought I, I, I will bring that up, which effectively means so far at a very fundamental level, I've only talked about firms, you know, but innovation applies to nations. Innovation applies to individuals. Each and every one of us can be an innovative leader. And thankfully, uh, cognitive psychology now says <clears throat> that, that individuals can be trained uh, to become innovative leaders. And, and so the one uh, uh, interesting thing that I always try to tell people is, uh, there is a famous uh, American author. There was a very famous American author, David Foster Wallace. He wrote an essay about 20 years ago called This is Water. And the opening paragraph of that essay basically says the following. There are two young fish that are swimming along in the sea when an older fish crosses them and asks them, good morning, boys, how is water? And the two young fish continue swimming along till one of them turns to the other and says, hey, what the hell is water? And that is exactly what happens in the real world in all, with all our managers. You're all every day working on innovation that sometimes you, you do things because that's the way things have been done. You don't actually step back and say, you know, what can I do for our organization to be innovative and so on? And that to me is fundamentally uh, uh, something that you need to uh, uh, you need to think about very consciously, and and hence I th th there are three parts to the equation when I think about becoming an innovative leader, and I call this mindful innovation. Be mindful of innovation as you are doing it every day, as you are thinking about execution every day. Remember, execution is extremely critical, but but execution. Uh, without accompanying innovation for the future is not good management strategy. As I started the presentation, innovation is risk management. Innovation is hope for the future. So you always need to think about the future and incorporate the future into your present, et cetera. So uh, very quickly, uh, to me, there are uh, three parts. The first part is connecting the dots. The, the second part of the equation is questioning conventional wisdom. And the last part is associating with different people. 
So when we think about connecting the dots, it's as the word implies, the ability to connect the seemingly unrelated questions, problems, or ideas. Sounds very, very, very theoretical. So I'm gonna to explain to you with, with certain examples. Fundamentally, one of the things that I urge people to do is to expose yourself to different disciplines. And I'm gonna give you a few examples. There is a, there is a very famous mall that was built in Zimbabwe a few years ago by an architect called Mike Pierce. Uh, it was, it was uh, 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 without any uh, major refrigerant uh, heating or cooling systems. And it, it was maintained at a very constant temperature. When Mike Pierce was asked about it, Mike Pierce said he learned it from the local termite mounds that he saw in Zimbabwe. Termite mounds are kept at a constant 82 Fahrenheit by these termites. So he went in and studied how they did it and tried to adapt it to his, uh, to his building. So this is called biomimicry. Or when you think about, this was a conversation I had with one of the leading hospitals about 10 years ago, when we were talking about it, how to design a better uh, emergency room system. My comment to them was, why are you not going to the local, uh, and, and this hospital was based in a place uh, where uh, uh, car races like like your Sholavaram in uh, Chennai uh, were very famous. And I said, why don't you go and look at the uh, pit crews of these car races? They have to change a tire in four seconds. It is, it is discipline chaos. Can you look at that, look at the lessons from there and adapt it to uh, an emergency room? Uh, when you think about uh, uh, American football, it's a, it's a very uh, physical sport and a lot of people uh, now are concerned that uh, there is a disease called CTE, which happens to be uh, impacting the brain and people, uh, it's a brain disease, if you will. And so uh, one of the things that people are thinking about is constructing different types of helmets. And when you think about helmets, almost all of the people that, that are constructing the helmets are doing it as bigger and better helmets, you know, stronger helmets and so on. And there is a company that is working on it and there was a very interesting news article about it, which basically said, you know, let's not go on the same trajectory that everybody is going. Let's look outside in the world and see if there is any organism that uses his head, but doesn't seem to get these uh, concussions because concussions are a, uh, are a significant driver of uh, CTE or this brain disease. And, and they uh, landed on the woodpecker uh, because they realized woodpeckers uh, peck uh, at a tree about 400 times and at very, very, very high uh, uh, you know, velocity, if you will, but don't seem to have the concussion problems, et cetera. And when they studied woodpeckers, they realized that woodpeckers have a blood layer around their brain. Again, I'm not explaining it technically uh, well, but, but you get my picture. And they decided a sleeve around the neck was probably a good way to go as far as building this helmet is concerned, et cetera. But the broader point that I wanna make to you is when we think about connecting the dots, when we think about innovative problems every day that we have, sometimes it is not about studying from your own industry. Sometimes it is looking at other people and saying, if other people have solved the problem, can I use it? And one last example I'm gonna give here is that of Steve Jobs. Uh, Steve Jobs gave a commencement speech in 2005 to Stanford. If you have not studied it, I would urge you to study it because to me, it's a classic uh, primer on what good innovation is. But one of the things he talks about is how he studied calligraphy in 1975 in Reed College. And, and he thought there was no use for calligraphy uh, in his life. And until he started designing the first computer uh, in the early 80s, uh, Mac, and, and they decided that Mac had to be beautiful and his calligraphy principles actually informed not only his design, but also informed the font, et cetera. And, and, and the thing that I, I wanna emphasize here is that if you expose yourself to multiple fields, if you allow your direct reports to be, to be risk-taking, again, yeah, you need to define what is the appropriate amount of risk and so on. 
odds are you are going to get solutions and then you can you can go ahead and and execute it uh, but the thing is if you are never exposed uh, to these kinds of solutions uh, then the odds are you are not going to be innovative you know uh, when i think about let's say a, a play uh, 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 my mind doesn't go like a dictionary and uh, or when i think about theater my mind doesn't go like a dictionary it goes from a to b to c to d to e it thinks of a network of concepts it it brings about the first play that i acted in it brings about the broadway play that i have seen with my family my wife took me to new york and and we saw a broadway play or it i i think about my children acting in local plays and so on think about it it's a concept and that's basically what you need to understand as long as the concepts are okay uh you are you are going to be fine uh, uh you know you are going to be uh, innovative the one common thing i hear from managers is oh i am not creative therefore i am not sure i am innovative and that to me i can tell you right now based on my experience that is absolutely false there is a, obviously a continuum of innovative creativity etc but everybody can be innovative as long as we are mindful about it so that's point number 1 Point number two, very quickly, it's about uh, questioning conventional wisdom for me. It's as simple as uh, this. Uh, uh, you know, when you think about again, forget uh, whether Tata Nano is successful in the long run or not, but Tata Nano arose out of a question: uh, How can we make our transportation safe and affordable for people who are traveling in a two-wheeler? and especially when we think about the emerging markets people there are four or five people who do who are on a two wheeler etc and that is basically con uh, questioning conventional wisdom right and and people said well one of the classic things when you move from a high cost product to a low cost product managers say oh let's de feature what that means is take away the features from the high cost product and then we make it low cost and to me i'm going to tell you my friends it just doesn't work in the real world a lot of times when you are thinking about transformative products it requires different kind of value engineering which is kind of what uh, what tata nano to me uh, uh, signified and i want to give you two other quick examples before i uh, move on uh, there is in american baseball uh, there's a there's a very famous story that came out about 2 or 3 years ago of a guy called steve delabar Steve Delabar was a substitute teacher who was teaching uh, physical education in a Tennessee school. Uh, he had played in the uh, National Baseball (MLB) as they call it, Major League Baseball, and he had injured his shoulder. And the doctor said, "You can't play baseball again. Go and uh, do something else." And he was 21. He went became a substitute teacher. When somebody approached him and said, "Hey, we have developed a regimen, exercise regimen for baseball players, and that requires..." training with a weighted ball uh you try to throw it but you don't throw it so it's 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 a simulation of of throwing action if you will so steve accepts it he uh, introduces it to students he also does it in a year he realizes his shoulder was much better and he was starting to throw at 90 95 miles per hour and and it is it's very similar to cricket when you see uh Jasprit Bumrah or or somebody bowling at that pace it's exactly the same thing uh and then uh, people say you know scouts come to him and say oh you know we want to see you pitch and he's pitching very well and team start calling him and two or three years after his injury and doctor said he can't play ever again steve delabar came back and played for the major league baseball very successful player uh for those two or three years and and the story is not about steve when when they went to the exercise regimen people and they asked the exercise regimen people hey how did you design this they said we asked a fundamental question is baseball the only sport that has violent shoulder motion and they realized tennis was the same and and when you see a serena williams serve her second serve is at 105 miles per hour and and so the shoulder is absolutely absolutely you know uh, impacted very heavily in tennis as well but the difference is in tennis there is follow through once you hit the ball the racket goes down and it follows through and and you know 
And uh, the only quibble that I have here is that they did not consider cricket, which I think is the greatest sport of all. But, 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 but the broader point is questioning conventional wisdom. And the last thing I'm going to say is a New York Times article that came about uh, about a few years ago, where neonatal incubators are donated by all countries to certain African countries. Neonatal incubators in the Western world is about forty thousand US dollars. They are, uh, you know, uh, well-minded uh, people send these uh, uh, ventilator, uh, venti incubators. A year or so, because of voltage problems, etc., there are brownouts, and these new incubators, uh, neonatal incubators, end up as paperweights. So there was this doctor who went to this African country, and he is looking around. And he says, what can I do to make this better? Because there are so many neonatal incubators that are being wasted here. And he decided to, he saw a lot of Toyota 4Runners in that the city. He saw a lot of mechanics. And, and they actually built a neonatal incubator made of Toyota 4Runner parts. And, and now uh, the cost came down from $40,000 to $1,000. It is probably not what you would use in a Western world, but in an emerging market, it met a particular need. And, and it worked very well. And, and if there were problems, there were technicians who could, who could handle it and so on. So my point is Western conventional wisdom. Uh, when Michael Dell uh, in the 1980s, uh, mid 1980s was designing computers uh, for through his, you know, out of his dorm, People said less than 2% of the people in America have had a computer. Computer selling is also about education. Do you have the ability to support the, the uh, education for the 98% of the population that doesn't have your product? And Michael Dell's answer, which is legendary, and I want you to think about it is Michael Dell said, I'm not focused on the 98%. I am focused on the 2% that actually will start requiring another computer, a replacement computer, a computer for their home. I don't need to educate them. Therefore, I'm going to go do a mail order, uh, you know, computer, etc. So that is conventional wisdom. And the last part, uh, I'm not going to be spending too much time on it because I, I know I'm running out of time. Associate with different people. If you are an accountant, don't just stay in an accounting conference. Meet the marketing people, meet the science people, meet technology people, network. That's the term people associate with this and so on. So network with other, uh, different people. Uh, Steve Jobs used to uh, construct his offices and he used to say bathroom breaks need to be uh, informative. And, and uh, so what he did was he mixed up the people uh, in his offices so that people had to meet at the water cooler and, and the serendipitous occurrences actually helped in the long run and so on. Uh, so this is basically uh, what mindful innovation to me means. These three aspects of connecting the dots, questing conventional wisdom, and associating with different people. And, and so what does mindful innovation do? It actually changes your vantage point. And, and I'm going to give one last example of what this means. Uh, you all know Sputnik, the Russian satellite that went up in the late 1950s. And uh, uh, when Sputnik went, it was emitting certain, went up, it was emitting certain frequencies that were being captured on the radio by a couple of physicists out of uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. They were doing it as an experiment. They were trying to figure out where Sputnik was at that point in time. About six months later, their boss came to them and said, hey, uh, you did a very interesting project six months ago. There was a, a moving object in space and you were stationary on Earth and you were able to figure out where, what the location of the satellite was. Can you flip that problem? Can you track a moving object in Earth on Earth with a stationary, relatively stationary object in space? And they said, absolutely. It's just changing the vantage point and changing the equations, et cetera. And the modern GPS was born at that point in time. And so the, 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 the broader thing that I want to say to you is uh, with due respect to, uh, with all respect to Victor Hugo, no power can actually stop an innovation whose time has come. Uh, with these three steps that I have outlined uh, and with constant exposure 
uh, to newer and newer fields, but more importantly, uh, enabling your direct reports and people under you to also be innovative and take some calculated risks, we can all be innovative. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop sharing and, uh, you know, uh, see if there are any questions. Great. Thank you. Um, so, Professor Ekambadi, there are a few questions I see in the Zoom chat. So let me go through those and then I have a couple of questions of my own. So the first sure. question is about, uh, do we need a great amount of money to innovate or is it uh, purely the uh, ability? Uh, do we need great amount of money to innovate? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. No, I, I absolutely think, you know, this is something that I said to... Uh, uh, Professor Nagaraj, when we met uh, uh, virtually about uh, three or four days ago. I personally think, and this is why I'm so excited to make this presentation, it is actually the contrary. It is not about resources. I tell a lot of my uh, the managers that I deal with, executives, C-suite executives that I deal with, don't give too much money. Necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, the entire Jugard innovation, the frugal innovation movement uh, that we are thinking about uh, is actually the way to go in the future. When you think about uh, Google, the term reverse innovation, uh, great innovations coming out of, uh, of, of, of places like India and China, which used very limited resources and, and you scale those innovations they are actually coming back into marginalized markets in the Western world. So I would absolutely say to me, it is about the ability to think differently. My hope for you is that all of you become CEOs soon, chief entrepreneurial officers, people who do things differently, who think differently and who do more with less. So it is absolutely not the resources. More resources actually uh, can become detrimental to the long-term innovative prospects because there are sunk cost issues and so on and so forth that uh, that step in, that come in. Yeah. Go ahead, Rahul. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, continuing on the same, uh, is there something that is uh, inbuilt in a, in a person that uh, enables him or makes him or her a successful innovator or do you think that it's something that is learned over a period of time? To me, I'm basing this on psychology, cognitive psychology. There are lots and lots of studies that have come up in the, in the last 20 years or so that basically says innovativeness can be taught. When I think about innovation, and if I were to give people advice on, on what, what does it mean uh, uh, to be innovative, to me, there are three things that I would say to you. One, be process oriented, not results oriented. If you follow the right process, correct results will come in. If you are results oriented, sometimes you might hit at the result, but the process is not correct. So you can never systematize it. Once in a while, even a blind squirrel finds a nut. So be very process oriented because process can be systematized and replicated and and and. Once you get something, you can keep on doing it and so on. Second, be curious, read. Uh, you know, uh, uh, my advice to you is 10% of your time every week has to be spent on reading outside of your, of your uh, stuff. And people say, well, uh, I don't have the time, et cetera. And uh, for me personally, once I stopped getting out of my WhatsApp group, my families, et cetera, I had so much uh, time and, and I hope you understand the joke there. But anyway, uh, but, but be curious. Uh, it, it, don't, don't think this is not useful to my job and therefore I'm not going to read it, et cetera. That to me is, is actually a, a, a detrimental way to think about it. Third, respect people, respect everybody. Uh, and I, I say this not in a, you know, very, uh, oh, you know, uh, uh, it's a moral piece of advice, et cetera. But everybody that you meet has value to add. Uh, the, the, the janitor in your organization, you know, we never look back and ask. And again, if I had a lot more time, I can explain some of the things that have happened to me personally and so on. But, but 
what this respect does is people are going to think of you as open-minded and not dogmatic, and they are going to advise you. They are going to give you suggestions. And sometimes the suggestions may work. Sometimes the suggestions may not be something that you should be thinking about. But the moment you project this respect and you become open-minded, I promise you, great, great, great things are going to happen to you. Again, I, I can speak about my own experiences that, that speak to this uh, uh, particular thing. But the one piece of advice I'm going to give you is if you are the smartest person in the room, in your organization, in your, in your meetings, et cetera, then my advice is get out of the room because you, you know, there, there is no innovation that's going to happen there. Uh, but so, so think about uh, people and, and when you think about projects, et cetera, think about assembling people who are likely to come up with interesting ideas, et cetera. If all we are expecting our people to come up with our sane ideas, then innovation is never going to happen. Sometimes it is the insane ideas, you know, uh, that comes in. Having said that, I'm going to be uh, slightly cautious. All of you are working for execution-oriented organizations, which means 90% of your jobs is probably about execution. So when I'm talking about innovation, I'm talking about that 10% of your time and 10% of your thinking, et cetera. So it is the balance between execution and innovation uh, that's gonna matter uh, for all of us in the long run. Great. Uh, so there is a related question to that. I mean, innovation in a sense is always perceived and this is my, uh, my personal kind of experience or uh, you know, what I have seen generally people perceive it as is necessarily disruptive. Now, is that is that true? Uh, it can it be uh, very incremental and uh, relating to disruptive innovation? Is it is a lot of this going to break into the conventional wisdoms and the fabric of uh, the way we function? I mean, it, is there a danger that lies in there of uh, mass mass scale innovation, if you will? Can you repeat the last line, Rahul? I couldn't hear the last line. Yeah. So, is there a danger for? Uh, so, there is a there is a way we are all functioning, uh, various societies and cultures. Uh, yeah. There is a system and structure. Now, is there is there a danger of uh, things suddenly sort of breaking down if uh, there is a mass scale innovation, quote unquote? To me, I have a different view on this, uh, Rahul. Uh, I personally, and I'm working on a lot uh, in India and emerging markets, I personally believe uh, that we need innovation at scale to solve the problems of the world. I, I absolutely believe in this. This is my uh, 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 philosophy. So too much innovation, uh, 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 to me, uh, at least, at the current uh, levels of innovation that we are seeing, et cetera, it is, it is not a bad thing to improve on the innovation, et cetera. Having said that, I think you raised a very interesting point about uh, uh, disruption, et cetera. I don't want to get into the technicalities. The one thing that I'm going to say to you is be very careful of how you introduce an innovative product. Uh, people always say to you, uh, uh, fail fast, fail often, fail spectacularly. That used to be the mantra for innovative uh, uh, people, et cetera. And I'm gonna to say to you, that's probably bad advice. Learn fast is what I will say. So when you are thinking about a disruptive innovation like what Rahul said, think about a very small segment of the market that you can test. The process innovation in your organization, you can test at a, at a slightly higher level, et cetera. In other words, you also always need to understand the you know the boundary conditions of your innovation etc and that can actually be controlled by by how much you introduce where you introduce how do you uh, correct uh, uh, your model etc before you go for a full scale launch i know that i have i've dealt with this question in the abstract uh, more than happy to talk about this but two points i absolutely think innovation at scale is critical but before you go to innovation at scale, uh, my advice is experiment, iterate, build models before you actually scale. That actually is the right way uh, for, for, for society. Right. Now coming to 
coming to the practical practicalities of innovating in within organizations and uh, i will try to combine uh, as well as possible some of the some of the questions which are here uh, so that yeah. i form try to form maybe a couple of questions out of those is uh, what we constantly see in corporates over the last maybe several years uh, and maybe india is lagging a few years behind uh, other other markets is there is a lot of talk there are several programs and uh, you know everyone is encouraged to innovate and there is a lot of tracking and things like that of innovation yeah. but uh, when the where the rubber sort of hits the road uh, we often find run into situations where you don't see things coming to fruition so yeah. the, the, and and often often times the 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 thing that is held responsible is we don't have the culture we don't have the the necessary uh, support from executives etc so yeah uh, whereas uh, you know personally even personally when i see certain products which get uh, put up on either ebay or other places coming from china uh, as a mechanical engineer or even as in in other disciplines of engineering i i do i, I think i have we somewhere have to admit that there are more uh, sort of innovative products and so what is actually happening there in your view i mean and are indian corporates uh, more and more uh, risk basically risk averse and uh, they don't sort of there is is the advantage of having uh, the service service uh, market with us i mean us having a lot of revenue coming from the service market is that actually working to our detriment great question rahul so i'm going to try to uh, so when i think about the world uh business world i think in terms of three different uh, buckets i think of the uh, structure uh, the organization structure etc i think of uh, the culture and i think of capabilities and to me capabilities uh, uh include uh, resources uh, res uh, processes as well so structure culture capabilities uh to me i say this to people all the time in fact i was in india end of uh, february talking to a lot of corporates etc i do think the mindset is changing uh i always say to people execution is of priority for you at this point in time i understand that you know you are in a, a bpo business you are in the uh, cement business whatever you are you need to innovate uh, you need to execute obviously but do not forget that you are actually doing a great disservice to your shareholders if you only focus on execution and not think about innovation because innovation at its best form is actually risk management for the future you are going to be caught all of a sudden 3 uh, 4 years from now when you see uh, 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 other incumbents uh, innovating or or this is the great danger that i'm seeing you use the word disruptive rahul the great danger i see now competition has no boundaries uh, who would have thought 30 years ago john deere would be competing with mahindras today look at what is happening who would have thought that byju byju's would be a 10 billion dollar company seeking uh, you know newer uh, uh, things etc you don't know where competition is going to come from they may be established companies from anywhere in the world or they may be emerging startups that you don't even have on your radar etc so so obviously uh, to me uh, very quickly i will say innovation is an attitude everybody in your organization should have that attitude innovation is not about one innovation department etc that that's not uh, uh, what this is all about etc so Uh, my prescriptions to corporate uh, partners is uh, there is a learning involved and that is why i think uh, dayanand sagar university and people like you have a role to play in terms of fostering that innovative orientation among employees what does innovation mean and how do you ensure that you develop an innovative culture and more importantly develop the capabilities etc but the last thing i'm going to say is you cannot do all these things without the right kind of structure uh, as well so some organizations have gone out and uh, you know have separate uh, innovation departments and so on and i say to people only do skunk works 
if the newer product that you are looking at conflicts with the value of the existing product otherwise you are better off you know uh, within the same organization etc and uh, happy to uh, expand on it uh, uh, later on if you want but but the the thing that i am seeing american corporates do is all of them have gotten into uh, the venture business they all have a venture fund and this venture fund actually goes out looks at the startups around the world and starts monitoring these startups and uh, once these startups are are at a particular point in time they are able to buy them out either either separate uh, from them or integrate them etc so monitoring of of uh, uh, outside innovation is also an important part of your innovation uh, capabilities arsenal if you will right now there is one uh, question which of course uh, which goes to the very title uh, of your talk that is you know focusing on if we were to focus for a bit on leaders and what is okay. specifically the role of leaders in empowering teams to be innovative do leaders participate in innovation or stay off of it and let the people actually uh, do the best people uh, you know sort of innovate what is your view on this i absolutely think leadership is critical rahul really 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 critical and uh, uh, to me i look at it in uh, uh, i would say three different ways uh, i look at leaders to set the tone uh when you think about amazon and jeff bezos's latest article uh, latest uh, uh, missive to his shareholders his 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 the tone at at uh, amazon has always been one of innovation and he always says behave as if you are a day one company you know the the same feeling that you had in 1994 etc that to me actually uh, sets the tone uh, for your organization so as a leader Uh, you need to uh, 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 provide uh, the right kind of tone and uh, the right kind of compass, if you will, uh, uh, you know, for people to move forward. Uh, the second point is uh, reward people for their successes, reward people. for their failures when it comes to innovation i know this sounds very counterintuitive but hewlett packard came up with a kitty hawk uh, product in the mid 1990s uh, success, very 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 bad pro- very uh, it failed despite the fact that the product was ahead of its time again uh, it's a very interesting case study on about timing and uh, uh, patience and so on but the beautiful thing about hewlett packard was they basically rewarded people who failed because obviously there are experiences coming out of that failure that hewlett packard leveraged etc because when you set a tone that innovation is important and you penalize people at the first sign of failure then there is a there is a, a potentially a huge problem uh, and therefore uh, that is that is important and the third thing i would say to you it's it's all about people uh, people are incredibly innovative uh, and and you know this is the reference that you made to culture it is up to you to harness the uh, the people power you know we all think about horse power as engineers and so on but what about people power how do you can enable people to accomplish uh, uh, to their potential at at one level leaders have to understand that that they can just set the tone but it is up to the people to actually execute and so on it is actually up to the people to innovate so how do you harness the people power by setting the right structures by ensuring uh, the right incentives if you will and helping them develop capabilities and one of the things and this was a part of my visit to india last is i am pushing the concept of lifelong learning uh, to these corporate leaders it is it is lifelong learning you know it's it's not about going for two days to a university etc can we start having digital modules every uh, quarter and 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 stuff like that that enables people to be at the frontier and so on so 
to me, those are the three roles that actually leaders should play. And uh, they are very, very highly critical as far as building and sustaining innovative organizations. Okay, uh, great. I think we are five minutes uh, past our time. Uh, I think we have covered most of that. I hope I have covered uh, almost all the questions. And uh, thank you for patiently answering all the questions that people have. I will now hand it uh, back over to Captain Dean Subara. Uh, thank you very much, Rahul, uh, for moderating uh, so excellently well. Thank you, Professor uh, Echambadi. I would like to sincerely thank Dr. Raj Echambadi for his wonderful talk on innovation and building sustainable organizations. I'm sure all of us have been enlightened over the last hour or so. I would like to invite Dr. Echambadi um, to uh, Bangalore and India and uh, hope he can visit us on his next visit. I would also like to thank all our participants participants and distinguished faculty who have participated in this program. We have students from the full-time MBA program, the executive MBA program, and students from other MBA institutions as well. So thank you so much for being here. Finally, I must thank my wonderful team for putting this together. Uh, Dr. Rahul Dige, Professor Rajan, uh, Arvind, Malti, and Mohammad Imtiaz. And thank you once again, uh, Dr. Echambadi. I hope we meet again very soon and hear you uh, speaking again. Thank you. Thank you. This was a pleasure. My, uh, please feel free to distribute my PowerPoint slides. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, uh, thank you again. I look forward to visiting you in person. But more importantly, my wish and hope for all the students here is the world is yours. Use the innovative principles to change the world around you because when you change the world around you, the entire world changes and you have that power inside each and every one of you. That's my hope for you. Thank you again for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. And uh, participants, uh, uh, Professor Rajan has posted a link where you can claim your uh, e-certificate for this particular talk. And thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.